We do these every month with a bunch of makers in the community. This month is a little special because we have the CEO of Coda, she's here, here to go all the way from the Bay Area to come and talk to you guys about Coda and to also have a fireside chat with uh, Dave Mascardi from GameStorming to talk to you more about who, what that is and what, what it's all about. Um, just for starters, there's two links up on the screen. Um, one is to submit your questions for to share and Dave at this link right here. And then also we created a product launch to launch on ProductHunt.com. Put this uh, link as well to upload the game streaming template, which we'll talk about more in this uh, next, uh, next hour or so. Uh, who here is a current Coda user? That's nice. Okay, cool, good, good number of people. Um, so for those of you who don't know about Coda, uh, we're going to play a quick video on what Coda uh, is. Okay, let's start at the beginning. When we invented computers, one of the first things we did was make a digital document. Over time, we changed the interface from black to white, to have on features, and moved it to the cloud. But fundamentally, document spreadsheets haven't really changed. So we asked ourselves what we build to start from scratch. This is Coda. It's familiar and approachable like the docs are used to. But it comes with a new set of building blocks, like tables that talk to each other, used to show the data in different ways, formulas that can represent anything, and buttons that take action. So you can build a doc as powerful as an app. We see teams at all sorts of companies design tools that complement their unique ways of working. We see small businesses scale their operations without having to buy expensive enterprise software. Amateur sports leagues have built docs for organized events and league competitions. And a mountain biking instructor designed a better way to rent out bikes. So we think these docs are not just as powerful as apps, we think they're better than apps. Because anyone can make them. We can't wait to see what you've done. Button, 
and you'll see it changes these two columns status and check that out by pretty simple buttons, but they make it it makes it a lot more intuitive to work through this. Basically every doc that Ben sends us has a lot of buttons in it, by far in every picture. Um, and uh, it's a great doc, it's really simple, it's one table, a bunch of views, uh, and these buttons, the buttons uh, sort of feel like they magically move these bytes in the doc comes to everything that we prepare you now in sick bay, everything that's checked out is in my checkout. And he sort of go spend an afternoon on a weekend and build himself a thing that now runs the bike uh, checkouts at, at REI. The, uh, so the interesting thing about this doc, we first saw this doc uh, like four or five months ago, and it became our uh, sort of litmus test case for our mobile experience. We called up Ben and said, would you like to hire a mobile experience? I know a lot of people here have been uh, trying for a while. And I just wanted to show what that, what that ends up feeling like. Um, and so what I'll do here is I'm just going to load here. Uh, we're going to load it side by side. So we've got, uh, on, the, on the left side here, we have the desktop version. And on the right side here, we have uh, the mobile version. And, you know, we had this, this phrase we used a lot, uh, a lot is you can build a document powerful as an app. The, the heart of that is we wanted people to make no changes as they, as they took their document and opened up the phone, we wanted them to make no changes to their, to their document. And when we shipped the, the beta, we shipped the beta about a year ago, the mobile experience was, I'd say, pretty Spartan. Um, and we did a lot of work on it. And I think a lot of people pushed us to new mobile. And we ended up doing a little bit differently than I think people expected. Uh, so there's two things here that, that are worth pointing out. So the first one is, if you sort of work through this document, you'll see everything kind of stays out in a way that makes sense on a phone. You can see all the different bikes here. Uh, the second thing is, you see these uh, tabs down here. So these are just sections. So people need to go to sections in Coda are like uh, tabs and spreadsheets for different sideways. Um, and a uh, very powerful concept, uh, but when they show up on a phone, we turn them into the bottom out of our. And then if you go look at each table, so normally if you were to take a spreadsheet that has a table like this and stick it on a phone, you would just get a big horizontally scrollable interface. Uh, so we support that here, so you can come here and you can see exactly what you see on the desktop and you can sort of work your way to your table. But by default, we can do what most every developer would do if they took their product apart on the phone and we turn this into a set of cards so that work uh, directly on your uh, directly on your phone, make, uh, make a lot more sense here. And then the one last thing that was really the sort of magical moment here was we take these buttons, these sort of nice little interactions, and we turn them into swipe behavior. So I come through here, uh, I can go and check in and check out these bikes. Um, and I tell the story for, uh, for, for a couple different reasons. Um, I think from a product perspective, I think it's it's a you know, super important piece of our, our vision, a doc of powerful as an app. I found that I used to I used to show people this and say it's a doc of powerful as an app. And they they kind of squint at me and and, uh, and say I kind of get what you mean and then when I show them this they get it sort of instantly. Um, I also think from a story perspective, if you think about this person Ben, you know, no responsibility for IT, no responsibility for software, uh, you know, spent an afternoon, thought he was building a better spreadsheet, ended up building an app. That's not what they use, they go around and obviously they're all on the go all the time. Checking and checking out bikes. So uh, I think this is a uh, this is a sort of first half of what I wanted to show you when we talk about adopting powerful now. What do you think? Great. Good. All right. So uh, I'm going to switch over. So the next thing I wanted to show you is so if I were to take we were in beta we for about a year, and if I were to take all the different feedback we got, mobile was very high on the list. But by far, the number one thing people asked us for Coda was how do I integrate Coda with the rest of my world? Uh, all the other tools I already use. And for that, we ended up building a uh, system called Cats. Who here has already used Cats? Good. Um, so I'll explain what Cats are and where this uh, where this came from. So the basic idea was uh, is that we take all these different services, and for every service, when you add a pack to a doc, it extends the document in some way by connecting to that service. And the very first one we built, when this was actually built for the Amazon project, and then gradually turned into a part of the product, the first one that was built was uh, weather map. It's a really simple idea. You connect the, uh, the weather service, and connect the weather, and it extends the document by giving you a couple new things. So I can come into code here, and someone give me an interesting location. Our data. Our data. Um, <laughs> I don't know, is that a computer? That's pretty cool thing. All right, I think that's probably correct. So now, uh, now I have tornadoes, uh, temperature is 80 degrees, that seems about right. 
Um, so it's pretty, you know, it's pretty useful. It's a good proof of concept demo. One of the core ideas of Coda is that when you reference uh, reference things, you can reference the whole object. The same thing is happening here. You can think about this as kind of giving me a remote reference to this object. So I can take this and everything I see in that cover card. If I hit dot, I can see all the properties. And so I can go say, you know, give me the current temperature in Barbados, and it's going to give me this current temperature. Okay. So that sort of idea of extend it to another service, pull it in, and still use all the Coda metaphors. Of, uh, of being able to, um, you know, reference things and be able to pull properties out of them and so on, all, all just works. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then we thought about what about uh, doing something the other direction? So this pulling data into a document. What about pushing things out into the real world? And so for this, I'm going to show um, a different pack here uh, from a company called Twilio. Um, this is Twilio. And so Twilio, um, who here knows Twilio? Good. So I showed this to my wife, and uh, uh, she's a physician, um, and never heard of Twilio. I'm going to try to explain to her what it is. They will give you a phone number, and if you're a developer, you can send text messages from it. Uh, and she said, wow, that sounds like a really terrible idea. Um, and it's a problem I never worked with my company. Um, and uh, you know, I sort of gently explained that probably every text you get from Uber and Lyft comes from, comes from Twilio. Uh, but of course, if you're not a developer, you would never use the product. It's only built to develop. So this is my Twilio account. Um, uh, I have here when you when you sign up for Twilio, they give you a phone number. Um, so I'll use that phone number here. So so now um, uh, I need another volunteer. So I need someone who's comfortable sharing their phone number. With the group. Uh, all right, Stephen's going to be my uh, uh, be my volunteer. All right, so I'm going to add a, I'm going to add a button here. And so Coda buttons, the way Coda buttons work is they get a name, they get a label. Uh, so we're going to say send, SMS, to Stephen. Let me see how what the name part says. Um, and then uh, they get a set of actions. So a set of actions that are relevant to Coda. So I can go out and row to a table. Uh, I can push other buttons. We'll get to that in a moment. Um, you know, I can send a Slack message, an email. Right here I'm going to send a text message. And I'm going to go connect it up to my account. I'll paste in that prompt number. And all right, Stephen, your turn. I'll say hi, Stephen. Here's a text from a top. Um, and just for fun, I'm going to give it. Uh, yeah, make sure you have um, I'll give it some color and a little icon. We can uh, send the SMS, and Stephen's going to verify for us that he got it. But right, it's good. Otherwise, it'd be Twilio's fault. Um, <laughs> they, uh, uh, so, so that's pretty simple. It's a, it's a nice, fun, um, uh, fun demo. Send a text from a document. Probably something nobody ever expected to do. Uh, it may not be obvious why you want to do that. Um, so why, why might you want to do that? So I have a, I have a very simple scenario here. Is uh, you know, imagine, imagine uh, I'm a photographer, and I come in here and I get my uh, my newest client, uh, my guy Steven. Uh, this is the phone number. Um, Below this table, I have a calendar view of the of the same table. So I can come in and say, all right, looks like I have a slot for Stephen um, at 10 a.m. on uh, on the 28th. Uh, and so you're going to see Stephen pop in over here. Uh, Stephen, where is where's 914 from? Uh, Westchester. Westchester. <laughs> <laughs> uh, New York. And so this formula here says, give me the forecast for that location on that day. Uh, and it says, okay, it's going to be mostly cloudy on that day. Uh, let's say maybe I want to move it over to, uh, to tomorrow, and we'll see how it's going to be cold. I don't know the forecast. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so this last one here says, I write a little message. It says, hi, person. We're on a meet for a photo shoot on this day at this location. And here's what the weather forecast will be. And then finally, I have a button here. Uh, even another text, and it's going to give him a text that tells him what uh, what to expect for this photo shoot. And it looks like he's got it good. Um, so that's pretty good. And I guess a photographer, I'm feeling like I'm feeling really good. My clients all all uh, all feel like they know they know what's happening. Um, but I still have to like wake up every morning and press all these damn buttons. Uh, and I'm a pretty good photographer. Um, and so uh, the one more thing you can do here is you can go create an automation. And so I can go out of rule. That says uh, you know, set a bunch of triggers when something changes, or maybe I just do something that says every day at nine o'clock I want to go take an action, and you know here I could go reset up that same action. Or in Coda, most things tend to compose together, so if you do it once, you can then refer to it. And so here I can say I already set up those buttons, so I can just go push those buttons. 
And I'm not going to turn this on, it's going to text all the people. Uh, and Stephen already got two texts from me, which seems like funny. Um, uh, but in this way, I can now go and create this doc that really acts like an app. And to sort of split these two sort of side by side, the way I think about it is on the right side, we've been working on how do we make docs that, that feel like apps. And over here, we're trying to make docs that really act like apps. So that's, the, that's how we think about Coda 1.0 and what we've been working on. So, quick introduction. Um, any thoughts? Great. Good. Um, and we'll talk more about it in a moment. Uh, so I was going to now transition over and uh, and talk a little bit about our topic for the evening. We're going to talk about game storming. And uh, in order to lead into this, I'll, I'll show you just uh, um, uh, one more thing. Uh, so hopefully everyone here has had a chance to come play in our temple gallery. So a lot of people start in Coda, they start from blank, they build up, uh, things up. But very common that people end up showing in the temple gallery and going through all the different things here. A um, couple things I want to point out with the template gallery, if you have a great template, there's a little button here, you can sub submit your own docs. All the best templates in here have come from, from other people. Uh, you'll see some of them, uh, the ones at the top are the, the featured ones, featured from our makers. Uh, we'll take them, and for example, this is one from, this one from Spotify. Um, uh, here, uh, here in New York, this is uh, Tracy. Actually, if a, it's, if a doc gets uh, pushed to the top of this gallery, uh, we make this little character for you. So this is actually this is what Tracy really looks like. So I banned it. Um, and each of these templates are built to be sort of the best practice of that, of that team. So in this case, they took the Spotify squad model and they turned it into a doc that is sort of a central place for everything, uh, everything that they need to run a team. Um, but I was going to show you another one, and uh, I'll show you this one, mostly so because it's mine. Um, so this is my uh, my template for to do lists, um, and uh, there's uh, the the, the backstory here is this started as an email to my team. So before Coda, I, I used to work on YouTube. So people used to work with me, um, and uh, I got asked a lot how I manage my time, and the, so I wrote this email to my team. And I started with this big warning, said to this is super personal, this may not work for you. Um, and then I went into a bunch of different philosophies. And you know, the first one is, I think people split into two types. You're either an head to sketcher or you're a piler. And head to sketchers, they start every day fresh, blank sheet of paper, and pilers get stuff out of their head and into their tasks. Just quick, who here is an head to sketcher? Who here is a piler? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> what is the selection bias for this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and just get you're going to really hate this template. So, uh, uh, and so it goes through uh, some different philosophies. There's this famous one from Mark Twain about eating a frog is the first thing you do in a day. It's kind of gross, but it works. Um, and there's a bunch of other things from uh, getting things done and so on. And so it started as a um, uh, as an email, as sort of a, a point of perspective. And the rest of this template walks through the process. It says, here's how you come and you set up. Uh, you set up your pilot, so your pilot, the first thing you have to do is set up your pilot. And every pilot knows you have 20 pilots and spend all your time pilot. You can't do that. Uh, and so you have to be very careful how many pilots you set up. And so I do these three, I do priorities by dates, I do categories by department, and I do me, not me. So I don't assign tasks out to people, I just say it's my plate or not my plate. And then you set up your view of how your task tables work. Again, as few columns as possible, you don't want to garden all the time. Uh, so this is what mine looks like. Uh, and then there's a bunch of useful views. So this is my primary view. Uh, it's what's on my plate, what's not on my plate by uh, by time frame. And I have this little slider here so I can focus. So I can say, all right, I see what's on for uh, for today. Um, and then there's a bunch of other views here. So this is like an agenda view. So I can see just a, a, a clean view of what's happening. And just like everything else in Coda, it's all connected together. So you know, if I drag this over here, you'll see all the all the bullets change. And then there's a little automation here. That every day at uh, 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. Um, so why do I show this introduction to game storming? The 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 best code docs all feel like this. In fact, like whenever we write templates, I always recommend people write this part first, write the perspective first, um, because the, the best code docs tend to bring a best practice to life. Think something that we otherwise know and talk about and make it action action. And so the story of the of, uh, of game storming and uh, day we're going to introduce in a moment. Um, I got pointed out this book uh, uh, about uh, Sam Booyer's read the book. Great, Dave, you have a, you have a, a, a fresh crowd. Uh, one of my favorite books, I highly recommend it. We can talk about copy for them. Uh, the, um, the book is all about how to reading, and I like to say it's one of those books where I picked it up and I started reading through it, and all of a sudden, all these things that I've already been doing 
uh, sort of show up in the book in a very like codified kind of way. Um, and so we reached out to Dave. Uh, Dave was excited. Dave was a group uh, that uh, focuses on helping people implement game from. Uh, and he'll, he'll talk to the method in a moment. And we asked him if he'd be interested in building a protodoc that represents the process. And so uh, Dave could come up, talk a little bit about game storming, and then we'll we'll show you what uh, we we'll ended up building with Dave. Welcome, Dave. Thank you to the Coda team. Kevin, Joe. I'm saying, yeah. And a special thanks to Al. Of course, Al did so much heavy lifting to make all this happen to all the games. To codify them. So thank you, Al. And thank you all for coming out. So, uh, game storming for me, I, I, I got exposed to it uh, back in 2010. It's when the book was published. I was doing digital strategy work down in Austin, Texas. And um, by education, I had an economics degree, which is to say, uh, I didn't go to art school. And I did not work for you. Uh, but the company that I was working for acquired the agency the authors founded and were working at. And game storming was their internal handbook. This is how they work. So all of a sudden, I had all of these creative colleagues, and all of my meetings now were done on whiteboards, and sharpies, and sticky notes. And in the same way that Chichirovich had this Eureka moment as he was reading the book, he said, this is, this is the codified version of everything that we're doing. I, I wasn't doing it yet. I wasn't even that far. Um, but I said, like, this is all the stuff that my professors told me to do and that my bosses wanted, but nobody ever tells you how to do it. And so for me, game storming was this handbook for how to work. And so it changed the way, for me, how I work individually. It changed how I work with my team. And it changed how I work with my clients. And we were getting work done. And we were having fun doing it, which is um, it just as equal in value to the work product you create is, it is the trust, it is the culture that you develop with the people you create it with. So, I've been working with game storming in some form or fashion for the last nine years, and now it's my full-time job. I, I did not write the book, but I essentially curate uh, everything game storming now. We're always adding new activities to the website, uh, facilitating workshops, and generally promoting I want to talk about what games storming is. Well, well, here. Um, it is, I mentioned a handbook. Um, it's, it's a set of recipes. Uh, it's, a set of, it's a set of recipes for how to work. So in, in that sense, it's a, it's a cookbook for work. Uh, but, but beyond the recipes, which I would say are probably about 80% of the book, uh, the first 50 pages, which I found that really because everybody wants to get right to the activities in the book, outline uh, a philosophy. And the philosophy stems from an observation that meeting stuff and the hypothesis that they can be a hell of a lot better. So when you want to improve something, what do you do? You, you break it down into its components and you examine how they work together. So what's a meeting? A meeting is usually smart people put together in a room to talk about an idea. And when you get this combination of variables right, you can do things, you can create outcomes that no other form of work creates. But so often, these variables aren't mixed properly. You've got the people that talk too much in the meeting, you've got the people who don't talk enough, and they should. You can schedule enough time for the meeting. Maybe the ideas weren't refined to the point that that particular group of people Talking. So what do you need to do in order to bend these variables? Well, you have to have an approach. It's a philosophy. Uh, an operation is the unofficial philosophy. Uh, if we had a, a monopoly games, there's actually, I noticed on my way up, there are plenty of games over there. Uh, one of them is monopoly. If we have monopoly game for everybody here, we could have 15 
16 Monopoly games, up and running, within five minutes, no problem. The highest paid person at the board doesn't start with any extra money. The introvert at the board doesn't start in jail. Games create a parity of participation, something that we'd love to see more in meetings. And so games have a formula of their own. Uh, when you look at what a game is, essentially the game is the game board, the boundaries. Uh, we have the supplies that you need to play the game, and the instructions, the goal for how you win, and then how you, how you play. So game storming is no different. Every activity in the book, and this is 865, I'm sure. Uh, every activity in the book has, let's quickly flip through. We have templates for everything, so that's our game board. We have a set of instructions, and we have supplies that you need to play all the games. The authors set out to democratize a, the, the creative process of the debate of creating. It's, it's supplies and categories of, of the game that really connect with game storming and, and Dakota and what we've done with these templates. Uh, the initial idea of game storming is that you, if you had the energy for an idea, you could walk down to your supply closet, grab a sharpie, grab some studios, and you could be ideating, you could be innovating, developing a strategy, putting together a project. But there's always been a use case that we haven't had a great example for. And that use case is virtual colleague, the dev team in a different time zone. So when Shashir initially reached out to me, uh, I think it was even in our first conversation, I got the idea of a virtual supply company. And that was really exciting to us. And as we went through, as he did work for me, the functionality within Coda, I was realizing that all of the other things that we were using up to that point to mandate that deep space were kind of a bad hack. Uh, Coda, gave us the supplies uh, and, and the structure to game store virtually. So we're really excited about the templates. Um, we'd love for you to use them, give us some feedback. Uh, I think we started with 13, 14. Um, there's over 100 game storming activities. We'd love to add more. We'd love to make them with the stars with them. So again, yeah, thank you for coming out. Go on, Should we show up the template? Yeah. All right. Um, all right, so I was really excited about this. I can pull up here. It's going to be about better than the overview. Um, this got published in the, in the gallery today. Um, so, so um, yeah. So, you want to give that to the next Yeah, so, well, the, the organization I think is important to understand because it speaks a little bit to beyond just the game, the activity itself, it speaks to the philosophy of, of game story. Um, we've got activities for opening, we've got activities for exploring, and then for good. So you can think about this in, in the book. The, the image is of a, a pencil, like a stubby pencil shape from both ends. Uh, and the idea is that when you open, like when you maybe go for a run, or perhaps you play an instrument, you're warming up, right? You're kind of getting, we call it getting in the room. Uh, and then you move on to exploring, so you're navigating ideas, you're testing, experimenting, you're not really self-editing. But then we get into the close phase. We, got, we have to bring these, these blue sky ideas back to work. So we're making decisions. And, and so we chose some of the most popular games um, to put into those categories. So you can actually pull from them real time in the meeting or set up your agenda beforehand. Um, for each of those instances, depending on which part of the meeting you're in. So I was going to show off some of the ones that are my favorites that we end up using a lot. So, by far, the most uh, common one we end up using is this thing called the Dory. Have you ever heard of the term Dory before? This is that. Have you ever know the bitch? Love the movie? So, it's called the Dory because this is the term you use Google. Um, because it's a fish who asks all the questions, it's a, it's a story. Um, and it's a very simple idea. You come in and you, uh, if someone has a new question, you say, here's my new question, and then uh, people go and upload and download it, and you go through questions in order. 
very simple idea. Um, one of the best parts of this template is uh, when we were at Google, we said we had Friday meetings on the up, and this is how they ran. So every day we get up on stage, everybody at the company could go ask questions, and we said go to an answer in order. So we want to pay tribute to them every Friday, uh, and follow for the first 15 years to come, they would get up and answer the questions. Um, order of people's uh, priority. Um, so big meetings is like really appropriate. At Coda, what I found is we end up doing this. Any meeting of greater than seven people, we end up doing this. Which is like you're in the middle of a product review, a launch review, a what should we do about this issue? Uh, you know, someone just presented about this topic, what do people think? Uh, we'll end up taking this, we copy and paste it into a doc, and we say, all right, people go write the question. Two things happen because of that. Number one, um, uh, you get you get everybody participating. You have your both people, you have your wallflowers, all the people that sometimes get talked over end up being part of the conversation. And the other is you get this sense of um, our, by the end of the meeting, someone come out of our meeting is like we, we talk about all these different things, but I have no idea if we talk about the most important one. Now you get out and you say, well, regularly right say, oh, we talked about everything that had more than three uploads. Uh, now we feel like pretty good about it. We'll follow up on the rest later. So this one we use a lot. The, the second most used one um, at Coda is this thing um, called Pulse Check. Uh, and again, it's, a, it's an example of something where we had we've sort of been doing this didn't know what to call it. Um, and the, the way it works is uh, you come in, you have a question. And often you get into a meeting, you'll say, all right, what's everything? Before, before you get moving, you know, gradually work your way on, around the room, and by the time you work your way around the room and you've taken a half hour doing it, you've completely biased everybody's answer as you went around the room. Um, and so instead, take a, take a room full of people and you say, hey, I'm going to drop this thing into, uh, into the document. Uh, everybody answer your question with everybody else hidden. Uh, you know, I don't think we're going to be able, uh, you know, no way. Uh, and then I go and I unclick and, or I click and say, let's go see everybody's, uh, everybody's and again, very simple idea. We'll drop it in the middle of a, uh, sometimes we'll drop it in the middle of a meeting. We're in the middle of a process. They have pretty stop. Let's just see where everybody stands. Um, so each of these ideas is uh, pretty interesting. Hopefully, really impactful and, and, and pulling in your meetings. There's a bunch of other uh, great ones we can talk about uh, um, as well. But we post this a lot. Uh, post ops affinity map for a way to generate ideas and then turn them into turn them into groups. The uh, but the other thing I think is really important is we started this from. Our goal with Coda was to let anybody build a Dr. Powerful as an app. And some of those apps feel like you know a new way to manage bike inventory at a store. But in my mind, like those apps, the narrower and narrower they go, the phrase we often use is that there is no edge case. Uh, you could build an app not only for a particular bike store, you could end up building an app for a company, for a meeting, or for, or for a type of meeting, for a very specific meeting. And you end up designing the like, sort of perfect way to run, run that meeting. So I thought it was very in keeping with the code philosophy, and we use it all the time. So I was really excited to, to uh, bring this out. That's uh, that's games from me and Um And now, uh, we're, last thing, we're going to switch. And we thought it'd be fun to do this as a little bit of a group. And so, uh, so we created a doc, um, pretty simple doc. There's a URL there, edit.org uh, slash questions. Um, and there's a space in the doc to go and ask questions and upload and download them. And uh, Dave and I are going to run through this until Al checks it around the That's uh, is the idea. Um, so go ahead. Oh, actually, one thing I was going to say: if you open up on your phone, uh, you're going to see something that looks like uh, looks like this, uh, and you'll see all the different questions here. And you can go and upload and download them the way I showed you earlier. And if nothing else, you go in and upload and download questions. If you have something you can ask, uh, feel free to uh, feel free to add it. Uh, and actually, I was going to start with uh, Dave and I have written a couple of questions, so all people are thinking about their questions. So and so you scroll up to the link and zoom in a little bit. Oh, sorry. Scroll up to the link and zoom in a little bit. There we go. Okay. So while people are going through, uh, downloading the doc and um, uh, uh, adding their questions, uh, I have a few to kick us off. Um, so uh, Dave and I both put something for each other. So I thought I'd start with the. the uh, the, the easiest one, what is, what's the most popular game? The most popular game by far, I was describing it earlier, Free Birth, the four digit land, um, is the empty map. And I've got some copies, feel free to take the copies that are out there. Um, the empty map ended up getting picked up uh, by Stanford Peace School and IDEO, and they use it all the time. Um, they their toolkits. 
uh, it's we've, we've added it as as one of the yeah there it is. Um, it's fundamental. I would say you can start any meeting with it. You could you could do it in almost every workshop. Uh, the idea is you you're designing something or you're in a situation where there is some enigmatic entity, stakeholder, boss, customer that you are trying to figure out. And um, getting in their head will help us guide your solution. Right? The idea of the empathy map is that we take a trip around their sensory perceptions, what are they seeing in their world, what are they saying, what are they doing, what are they hearing, and then we can start to get into their head. What are they thinking and feeling? What makes their job easy? What makes it hard? Uh, and that is by far uh, it gets the most on the website. Uh, we get the most questions about it, and we get the best reaction when we do it in a workshop. And there is a proper way to do it. It's become so popular that um, we had to update it last year because some of the numbers on the campus to make sure people are doing it. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, you can go next. As a quick update, for folks who are getting to this on their phone, just make sure you sign in so you can get your questions locked. Uh, we'll oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I was going to say, what is the best? I was going to ask you, what is the best use of Coda that you've seen? But when you were talking before, you mentioned that you've seen some really insightful yeah, Coda. What, what is it from an insightful standpoint that you've seen that you were expecting? Oh, insightful. Um, and this, this one's pretty good. I think the, oh, I can pick a big one. Uh, I think the one that um, popped to mind for me, there's a, there's a couple of, I think the, there's a, uh, what, what's, the, what's her, uh, Shara Rock, is that her name? Evan, you remember what's, uh, she's in New York, right? Who? Um, Shara, Shara Rock. Shara Rock, yeah. Shara Rock. Um, so she sent us this one that I thought was really awesome, and uh, uh, she's, a, she's a researcher, is that right? Yep. Yeah. And she's done a bunch of research on, um, on in particular, on uh, productivity and how, how and how it affects women. And so she sent us this idea, this template for. Uh, so we get a lot of to, to do list templates. It's actually pick a category. Setting, setting goals and OKRs and to-do lists end up being at the top of the list, people send us those all the time. Um, this one was kind of unique. She's done a bunch of research on um, on how uh, the the uh, menstrual cycle for women affects their affects their productivity, and there's a bunch of research of like different phases and what types of activities you're supposed to do at different times. And it's great. She's got the great papers and a bunch of research, and she turned it into this doc with a with sort of a, uh, a layout of you know how you figure that out and design your to-do list in a way that makes sense for everybody in particular way of, uh, um, uh, uh, of their of men uh, menstrual cycle. And I just thought it was like really insightful, you know, totally surprising. I, you know, I went and thought, I looked through all the apps, and the apps were made for to-do lists, like all made by men. Uh, so it's like no, no surprise, like none of them had addressed this. Uh, but I thought that was a really good example of the work that they gave my yeah. yeah. All right, let's switch to, uh, switch to some of the questions that the group had for us. What What does the CODA, oh, no, that works for Steven. For Steven, all right, you can ask your question, go ahead. <laughs> I, I, find, I find that to be a, a good way to make sure you don't dehumanize the process. Yeah, what was the CODA 2024 like? What projects are possible to be possible? 2024, five years, huh? Uh, I mean, I think, I think the, the, the thing, you know, David was asking me earlier about, tell me about the people that don't adopt Coda, like, what, what does that feel like, and what about the ones who do? Uh, I think that, in the best cases, um, it's a, as an example, uh, I, I, I use a lot with, um, uh, with, with Uber, so the, the, the I, mean, I say this phrase a lot. We can make a doctor car with an app, and people say, what kind of app? And they say, you know, any app. And they say, what about Uber? Uh, probably like the number one thing I can ask. They say, which, which, which app do you mean? Uh, and I said, well, I kind of mean Uber, but I kind of don't mean Uber. Um, and the, uh, uh, and uh, we had this user, it lives in Idaho, 
uh, submitted the stock, and I'll, I'll get to the answer to this question in a moment. The domestic stock was, and runs a carpool service. It's uh, 24 different families. The school is about a half hour away from everybody. And there was a carpool service. That said, I mean, anybody with a kid, a 24 person carpool is like a crazy carpool. Um, and so he's running this thing. Every kid, uh, there's, a, there's a table of all the available cars, of all the available drivers, and all the kids and their constraints. I need to, I need to go, I need to go from this place to that place. Uh, this kid needs a car seat this height. This car has a car seat this height. It is a matchmaking process that gets done in Coda that pulls all these all these people together. And he's telling the story, and it's, it's super interesting because um, he says, just think about think about the impact of this uh, of this uh, document. You know, first off, if it makes a mistake, there's some poor kid sitting in school not getting picked up. It's a very human problem. I uh, had to go deal with. And then on the other side, if it works, you've just taken, you know, probably 18 parents and you save at least an hour out of the day. It's like an enormous amount of time saving uh, for, for this group. Um, and one of my running jokes, and I'm a big fan of Uber, they're, they're, they're uh, you know, big music in Dakota, um, but the, uh, you know, the interesting thing about Uber is we take rides from strangers because we can't figure out how to take rides from friends. Um, and I think that's kind of an interesting thing to think about. Like, what other human processes are there out there that we've sort of uh, relegated them to these companies that will um, do, provide great services, but not always adapt to what is what we need for our community or for our team, for our family, or whatever it might be. Uh, and so, so in my mind, I, I think that um, you know, when I was uh, for this job, I, I spent a while working on YouTube. And a phrase that you uh, use a lot is that online video is going to be cable, cable, and broadcast. And we're going to go from three channels to 300 channels to 3 million channels. Like, I just get asked a lot, a very similar form of that question of like, okay, online video is going to be cable, cable, and broadcast. Does that mean you're going to recreate the new ESPN? And what about Disney? So I would tell people, no, the new ESPN and the new Disney are not going to be any way recognizable to the old ESPN and the old Disney. Just like in, this, like, in the new Coda world in 2024, you know, I don't. I don't expect that like Uber goes away any more than ESPN went away. But I expect that a set of use cases that can serve in a much different way. And uh, you know, that's sort of what I was describing. Is there is no more edge case. Uh, and I think we go from a world of seeing you know tens of apps and thousands of apps to seeing millions of apps uh, designed for each community, for each meeting, for uh, for every different situation. Big question. Um, all right. Next one. Ryan, go ahead. Uh, is there a good way to collaborate, add notes, or have conversations with a teammate about a particular thing or a relevant coda? Um, kind of just the background on that. So it's the coda intercom uh, template that you created for our institution development and other things. Is it right ready? And sometimes having a conversation on those particular rows or items and, and have, have you already tried using the common feature here? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so, okay. so base level, you can do this. Uh, and you comment, these are threaded. Uh, you can comment, you can reply. If you have mentioned people, we'll pull them in the conversation, they'll get notified. Uh, I'll say it's a feature that I feel, I feel personally, is like half finished. Um, so we don't, and that's how we do it. So we, we obviously we, we run code on code. Uh, that's our bug system, our customer feedback system, our, our CRM system, and so on. Uh, and so we use those. Our conversations get pretty long, uh, and they sort of thread their way through. Um, one of the things I'd love to be able to do that we haven't done yet, but working on, is turn those into data themselves. So you can go and do, you know, go and write your own views for them, write your own button. Text me when somebody replies to this thread um, that you can't quite do yet. Uh, but that's that's how I would do it. Do notifications Yeah, so any, any mentions, any mention, anybody you directly mention will get notified, and anybody previously mentioned on that thread will also get notified. Sort of what you would expect. Um, all right, good. What are the best? Oh, sorry. Uh, Al Chen. Here's Al. You got the next question. Okay, thank you. Uh, one of the best tactics to keep remote team members involved in your video conference. You you may have better views of this. I think interacting with them. So, uh, so one of the ways that we design workshop or even activities is that there's, um, there's assignments or time for individual work, uh, for work and for 
work. So we might brainstorm, we might jot something down on our, on our pad, then we might share it with the person next to us, and then we might present the idea to the group. Um, meetings aren't good when it's just one person talking all the time, and I think if you're worried about somebody checking their phone off, like, are they looking at the screen, or are they looking at the phone off the side there? Um, I think the best way to do is to, to give them work. Um, and I think that um, naturally, uh, if, you're, if you're playing games during the course of the week, um, in larger workshops, when it's, it's a half day or a full day offsite, um, I think there are a couple of situations that come up when you have a remote participant. Uh, and one of the things that we do, it's just one person, if there's uh, maybe 15, 20 people in a room, and they've got one colleague who who's, uh, wants to dial in, we, we give that person a role. They'll have a job. Um, so if they're not necessarily doing what everybody else in the room is doing, but maybe they're the stakeholder that you empathize with, and their job is to keep you honest for the rest of the, uh, of the meeting. Or um, maybe, yeah, maybe they represent the boss um, or, or the budget holder. Uh, so when you give somebody a role, that's good. If you do have more than one person, if you have a group, it's good to keep that group uh, collaborative virtually. So this is where the perfect use case is voting. We're doing empathy maps in the room. We want another group to do an empathy map. So I think those are helpful. Well, okay. uh, it's worth mentioning. So, Coda has run. Uh, we have three different offices, so we uh, practice this all the time. Uh, basically, every Coda meeting is done the same kind of thing. Um, Al is a strong man based here in New York, uh, and and calls in for for meetings there. I think um, if I had to pick one thing, I would do is uh, is push people to keep the video on. Like a very natural tendency to turn the video off, and it, it, it easily allows people to exit the the, the discussion. Um, so that's probably, probably the biggest thing I would say. Uh, and then the other one is, I think constructing situations like this where it's like clear how to participate and like here's our, here's our story, here's how you do your sentiment thing, here's how we're going to do post up, uh, it's a pretty good way to bring people in the, in the discussion. All right, Raymond. Yeah. After yeah. a little point out, what's your next big milestone? Uh, next big milestone for, for Coda. There's probably, um, there's the, the one big one coming in and, the, and the, uh, the, what I would expect for most of the year. So the biggest one we're working on right now is figuring out um, uh, how to get Coda by call ready for business. So some of that is the set of features uh, and capabilities that ask for people are depending on the product. A lot of people ask about pricing, so the product is currently free. It's not going to be free forever, sorry. Um, although there will always be a, there will always be a free tier. Um, and one of the things I really like to do out of that is create a, uh, a model and incentive for um, for people who contribute to Coda to participate in the economics of Coda, something we did really well on YouTube. So we have of ideas for that, we have to talk about it. Um, the, uh, but the other thing I'd say is, you know, last year we launched, I think we were, we were pretty fast launching features, some, some, uh, some of them maybe too fast. Um, I suspect this year, uh, we'll launch, we have a bunch of things we're, we're, we're launching, um, but I think a lot of the interesting things we're doing are probably more like this, where we're seeing uh, use cases um, get launched, and I would expect that the launch to be a bigger and bigger part of how you see things. I mean, it's probably not apparent, but part of this game where we launch, people that are on the community probably saw it, but we launched an entirely new copy paste experience that we had to do before you could do this game storming thing. Because uh, you need to be able to pick this thing up and copy it to a new document and have all the logic within that range stay, stay together. That was a whole bunch of engineering work. Uh, so I didn't talk a lot about that, but underneath each of these things is, each of these use cases is a whole bunch of different work that, 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 uh, that covers that. So that's how I expect the next year uh, all forever. Um, how, how many more questions do I take? One more question. One more? Okay. Uh, now I'll ask. What does the question? Go ahead. Uh, yeah. What, what does an ideal brainstorming session look like? All right, there you go, Dave. Okay, so I think there are a couple of ways I want to answer the question. So, um, and I had the slides in the deck out. I deleted it. This is one of the slides I deleted for this. So I talked about that uh, pencil shape from both ends. I don't know if you can all see it. Um, but this is one way that I think about a game storming session or any agenda uh, is, this, is this pencil shape from both ends, right? Um, the session, the meeting has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Uh, and again, that's how we've decided to create the taxonomy for the, for the games here. Um, so, so that's how it flows. Um, 
if you were to walk into a game starting session and in, uh, into the room itself, uh, you can see circular tables with no more than five to six people uh, at the table. You can see there would be a flip chart. On the table, there would be four by six index cards, five by eight index cards, black sharpies, colored sharpies, 11 by 17. We have framework cards to spark your thought process. Um, there'd be a bunch of shit up on the walls that were there at the beginning of the day, uh, and you'd see a lot of smiles on faces, and um, that's definitely a hallmark of a good game session. Even, even a good meeting, you know you had a good meeting if you go walking out of the room, um, and you kind of feel the property, and people have smiles on their faces. So you've done a good job if you have a good game. Sounds like a great question, and uh, I wanted to thank Dave for, uh, for coming out for this, and for all the help. so much everyone for coming. Uh, big fan of game serving, I don't really know much about it before this whole project, and uh, I'm actually a remote employee myself, so I play a lot of these games with the uh, team more probably, so I actually have a real impact on my life. Um, we're all about big communities here. Uh, we do this every month to gather the few Dakota users and just makers in general. Uh, so our next uh, meetup is already scheduled for March 26th, the month now, so just go to Um, the sister also sent you an email about that. And uh, yeah, we actually participate a lot of communities in New York City. So one of them is the New York Enterprise Tech Meetup. Um, they meet, they actually have over 200 events in a year. And they meet just on a Fifth Avenue, I think, at 18th Street, so there's a few lots of here. And they demo a bunch of enterprise tech companies. Um, the next meetup, I think, is in a few weeks, and the co-founder of Datadog um, is presenting there. So definitely check them out, big fan, fans of them, and we'll collaborate with them in future events. And uh, the last community we're really excited to present is We Are Developers. Uh, they're actually based in Austria, I believe. Uh, they are one of the largest developer associations in the world. And they have an event called the World's Largest Built, uh, World Congress, which takes place in Berlin on June 6th and 7th. And uh, they are, apparently it's like the Woodstock uh, for developers. So, they have graciously given us a 25% discount code. Um, over 10,000 uh, attendees every year. I think uh, uh, Steve Wozniak was the uh, keynote last year. So we have like the inventor of CSS, PHP, talk at this thing, so it's a really, really big event. Um, we're actually big user of Coda as well. You can just Google, uh, we are developers, Coda, and funny. CMO talks about using OKR tools. And uh, they actually also gave someone here a free ticket to this event. It's worth like 200 euros. And I actually created a really quick Google, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Coda doc. <laughs> 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 uh, so this is actually Coda doc where we're going, I'm going to send a free ticket to someone here. And uh, this is actually for everyone that RSVP, so this might take a few rounds to find the winner. So I'm just going to put on this one up. It's going to randomize a little bit. And this might take Because we've known this in like an hour. Uh, so it's going to right? Oh. I may have canceled it. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can do it with the number of the bottom
Mars? Mars? Yeah. Mars is we'll, we'll, we'll do that. We'll find the list. Number 16 on Joe's list is the winner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, this button will send an email um, to that person with this number um, and give them a free ticket to go to the founders. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they're happy to be part of that, that community and make uh, sure users are that's it. And also, um, afterwards, after the food, we're going to uh, have some after drinks at Irvington, uh, which is on Park and 17th Street. This is a good lot of beer. So, hopefully, we'll see you there after the food is in the back. And we're also going to have some demo stations. If you want to check out Photo, we have a little monitor back there. And also, the field here is showing the different docks and stuff. And All right, the winner is Alan. Oh! oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, y